Hello and good morning, good midday, good afternoon. I think it really depends on where in the universe you are. We'll get started in just a moment. I'll let Zoom do its thing. But in the chat, if you would put in your name, your role, your institution, I'm assuming you're coming here from some sort of teaching and learning institution. And then also we're gonna spice it up today and you're gonna add one adjective to describe how you feel about AI and education. And I think to get started, um, I'm gonna put you on the spot, uh, Reed and Rufus. Reed, what's, what's your adjective today to describe how you feel about AI and education? <laughs> Um, exhilarated and terrified, both, <laughs> both, absolutely both. I think that's allowed. All right, Rufus, what about you? Relax and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, what did I, I was asked this question on, on Tuesday and my, I used to, I cheated. I said jazzed and curious because I said excited is just not quite there. Jazzed is a little bit more of a whole body experience. So go ahead, throw that I in the chat. One more, Kelsey, which is just hopeful. I've seen hopeful. a lot in the past week that makes me very hopeful. So. Awesome. Yeah, hopeful. That's a good one. Ooh, I'm seeing some Michigan State. Go Spartans. Hello, everyone. All right, we'll get, oh, hi, Reed. Reed Malone, a packbacker is here. He'll definitely help you, us out at some point. Um, curious, awesome. I'm very happy to see curious. Well, thanks so much for joining. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with today's session, the first of its kind. So we'll, we'll share a little bit more there. Um, but some housekeeping, webinar recording, um, and, and also an attendance certificate will be shared with all attendees within the next two days. So look out for that email. Now, all recordings can always be found for previous webinars at packbike.co slash webinars. Um, please ask all of the questions you have in the Q&A feature, not the chat. What happens is the Q&A feature is a queue. You can also answer other people's questions. So we, we let it rip. It's open. It's public. Um, we also have some packbackers in the chat and in the Q&A feature responding, um, sharing resources. Um, and then definitely use the chat. I love the chat. Share reflections, share ideas, but ask your questions in the Q&A features. And like I said, will be monitoring the Q&A and whatever we don't answer live, my colleagues will answer asynchronously in the Q&A feature. Um, thank you so much for coming in. If you're just rolling into the session now, please introduce yourself in the chat. And with that, let's do some introductions and, and kick this off. My name is Kelsey Beringer. I'm the CEO over at Packback. I am a former teacher. I was a high school chemistry and physics teacher and left the classroom to join Packback because I wanted to help instructors evangelize education. And I think uh, I was able to accomplish that goal and then some. So I'm, pr I'm pretty happy about that. And I'm happy to be here today alongside Reed and Dr. Rufus Glasper. So Reed, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Reed Dixon. I am our uh, over at Pima Community College and I direct our faculty development. And I have a background also in K-12. I used to direct a teacher ed program at Teachers College in New York City at Columbia University. I'm obsessed with AI and have been ever since ChatGPT came out. And I'm so happy to be with you all today. Rufus? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Kelsey and Reed. Uh, Rufus Glasper, President and CEO for the League for Innovation in the Community College and Chancellor Emeritus of the Maricopa Community Colleges. Uh, I'm excited to continue this conversation because every day it changes. So uh, I just ask everyone to uh, relax and enjoy and engage. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and yeah, this is the first session of its kind. You know, we've been working with um, over at Packback the League on a, a webinar series for quite some time. And it started as, hey, what is going on? <laughs> Stop, drop, and roll. We need to we need to understand what's happening. And we recently launched a series of workshops. And this is the first of its kind in kind of what I'm calling a podcast style session where we're going to talk about news stories. We're going to talk about application of new technology. So really, it's meant to be a learning community. So I highly encourage everyone to ask questions, engage in the chat. This is just as much an opportunity to build community and learn um, for everyone here. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Rufus to give us an introduction. Um, we'll talk about the news. We'll do a little bit of a panelist discussion, share some resources, and then end with closing remarks in about 55 minutes. So Rufus, over to you. 
All right, as, uh, as, Kelsey, as Kelsey stated, the League for Innovation in the Community College and PACPAC launched a series of generative AI webinars back in March. Uh, those sessions, as we thought uh, we were excited about it, have been incredibly helpful in providing a community to thousands of faculty and administrators blindsided by the sudden emergence of chat GPT and other generative AI tools that have followed. And I'm sure you've been reading a lot of these uh, in the documents over, over the months. We received a lot of wonderful feedback uh, after those early sessions, and we decided to continue and to move forward with additional webinars and workshops to help instructors better understand and embrace generative AI. Kelsey will share more information on future workshops and webinars before we launch today's uh, session. And, and, and she did some of that information, but we're continuing to modify. So please provide any ideas and, and comments that you might have so we can continue to uh, adjust and move forward. Today is a chance for this community of education professionals to learn more about the impact generative AI is having on education, policy, and our students. You'll hear from an expert on online learning, uh, Reed Dixon, about how we can more effectively leverage AI in our institutions and in our courses. Excuse me. <laughs> You'll hear what's new in the world of AI and hopefully lead better equipped to continue your AI learning journey with recommended resources. And finally, I understand and appreciate the diversity of this audience, not only in our roles and disciplines across K-12 and higher education, but also in our understanding and sentiment around generative AI. We know it's not the same. The response to transformative Technology always yields a spectrum, and our goal today is to welcome and give space to everyone on that spectrum. I ask today that you live the values of a lifelong learning, a learner by engaging, asking questions, and perhaps even adapt your perspective. My, you see, we're asking you to even change your thoughts. So sit back, relax, and engage. And Kelsey, it's back to you. Thank you so much. Um, and as a reminder, we have two workshops coming up, one next week, one in August, um, and those are active work sessions. We launched our first one last month. It's recorded, and there's also a resource guide um, on uh, the PackBack website, so feel free to look there. Those are great because you're actually just getting into the weeds. You're using ChatGPT. And then we have our very first, we're calling this a generative AI roundup. We have our first today, and then next month we'll um, do a part two, and I'm hoping to get um, some student voices on that session. So wish me luck there. Um, so let's get started. We're going to talk about what's in the news. And I have four featured stories that we're going to talk a bit about um, and dig into. And the first is Claude. Um, so Claude is a new GPT-like generative AI platform. Um, I think it's probably safe to say that Claude is making a name for itself. Um, I actually... I haven't used it much because I think it was launched two weeks ago, a week ago, but I'll say at this point, I do prefer Claude to ChatGPT. Um, so Reed, you and I were talking about Claude. Um, I can share my use case for Claude, but I wanted you to share a little bit more about your perspective of Claude and your use cases for it. Sure. Um, so I'm teaching a class right now, um, co-teaching with our Dean, Dr. Josie Milliken, a class on AI for teaching and learning for our faculty. And we focused initially just on ChatGPT and BARD and comparing the two or anything they can get their hands on really because we wanna know what students are likely to be using uh, as they in approach our classes. We wanna be able to red hat our courses and figure out, okay, well, how AI might be used for best or worst cases within our current curriculum. What excites me and interests me most about uh, Claude 2, which is now available as of this past week to the public, um, is its ability to ingest PDFs. And one of the strange things that I did recently um, was I asked it to ingest two reports and give me statistics that stood out from those reports. So again, you can, even from my phone, and I did this uh, top of the morning, I asked it to pull in a PDF from my saved files and it um, did a summary from first the time for class study, which was uh, produced by Titan Partners in conjunction with 
anthology, turn it in, Lumina Foundation, ever learn everywhere in Macmillan. And it generated a whole page of the most important statistics, including the reality that over half of students still plan to use AI regardless of whatever policy we create. That's what it generated. And that's an accurate statistic. It, it was a closed data set. Um, it can hallucinate, or actually that's not the word we should use, probably um, uh, I'm forgetting the phantom. It, it created phantom data. Uh, yeah, phantom like generation information. of phantom data. Yeah, that was, I think the phrase. And that's, that's a point, again, that we're all co-learning this together, but this class that I'm co-teaching with our dean, she promoted, you know, we really should be using the phrase phantom data rather than hallucinogenic data, which nobody likes that phrase anyway. Um, but with closed data, it was able to give me a quick summary of both of these reports. Um, there, I could go to a campus technology piece by uh, Rhea Kelly that's excellent, that has the summary, but I was in a hurry. I dropped it into the tool. It gave me a quick list categorically of all the types of quotes that existed within that report. Then I did the same thing with the WCET report that was authored by Van Davis and Judith uh, Sebesta, in which I asked it to pull statistics on where colleges are at in terms of 59% being in early stages of potential AI use, but no systemic, systemic action, et cetera. It's great at pulling data from closed data sets and giving me a summary. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it can gather a lot more data than other tools can. So this question came up in the chat and I'm, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but if you were to say, put in a, a, a survey or, you know, this kind of research and say, Hey, what, what page did you get that from? Would it be able to do that? Have you tried that? I, I actually did do that. And, um, I could share my screen as well, but I'll just say this one. It's really about how you talk to the AI and there's a self-teaching nature to most of the AI we're using. It's trial and error. It's play-based. Our students are learning it faster than we are because they keep playing with it. Um, they're even playing with, you know, trying to get the AI to say ridiculous things, but they're still learning by doing. And what I learned um, in my, my process, I'll often ask it to create a table, or I'll do that with ChatGPT and Bard. With, with Claude in particular, I asked it, create a categorical list of core statistics and includes a page number in parentheses from the report. And I double checked those pages and they were accurate. We do have to double check these things, but yes, it can do that from a PDF. Yep. Um, and by the way, the host for Claude is Anthropic. Does that sound right? Anthropic? That's right. Okay. I have it written somewhere. Um, and so I'm going to share my use case of Claude. As I'm sharing my use case, read, I don't know if it's possible for you to find those, uh, those uh, resources you were just speaking about and throwing them in the chat. Would that work? Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. So I'm gonna talk about my use case for Claude. Um, so at Packback, if you're unfamiliar with what we do, um, we have courseware, it's, we support assignments, writing assignments, discussion assignments um, in higher ed and then newly K-12. But what a lot of my team does is they work with professors who perhaps want to integrate Packback's platform into their, let's say new, you know, upper level psych course. And so what we've been using Claude to do is we'll take a syllabus from a professor that they've given us and we'll take information about our platform, you know, the problems our platform is solving, dialogue about every feature we have and how the feature should be used and what problem they're solving. And we'll say, hey, again, we give it a prompt, read this professor's syllabus, read more about the Packback platform. How should this professor use Packback? Why? Please reference the specific course objectives that Packback would support. Now, this is something that usually my team is manually doing. They're they're reading over a you know up to fourteen page syllabus. They're highlighting course objectives, and they're certainly still fact checking after the fact. But this is actually how our team is using it. And when I'm thinking about okay, what's the use case in academia? What if we're uploading our syllabi and asking for any contradicting information? Or what's the most confusing piece of the syllabus right now? And how would you recommend I fix this? Or what's the least inclusive part of my course right now? Like you you might get something silly or unhelpful, but you might also get something pretty awesome in return. So that's where my mind goes, Reed. Where does your mind go? <laughs> well, we're, we've already been doing this even since January. Um, faculty have come to me independently before we launched our course and said, hey, I wanna see how students can use AI in my class or how I can use AI to revise my class. This particular 
bit of curriculum is a little bit dry. It's not as relevant to our adult students. How do we make it relevant? And we'll ask it for three strategies, and then we'll choose one, and then we'll flesh that out. And we will rewrite curriculum that's based upon whatever we input. Please revise this paragraph, and we'll give very explicit instructions on what to edit um, so that we're the idea, we're the cognitive processors, and they're helping us just reshape it in a way that maybe angles more towards relevance for our students. Yeah. And that's with all the AI tools, I would say. Even the new tool, Dolly, which I have not played much with. It just came out yesterday. Um, yeah. There's still so much out there I haven't played with and it's like overwhelming, but I also, it's a little bit off topic, but it's okay. Um, I want you to share the story of what your student did. Um, well, I don't know if it was your student, but a Pima student did. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. You tell the story. It's funny. It's good. So um, I guess a few months ago, we held a retreat in which we, uh, at Pima Online, which is within Pima Community College, um, that was mostly in person. We had virtuals in the room. And on stage, we had two students talking about AI with our chancellor, our CIO, um, our, one of our department heads, and a colleague from the University of Arizona. And the way we set it up, I'll just share this one student's anecdote. He studies uh, at Pima Community College um, AI, and he's looking at technology more broadly as it relates to what can go wrong with AI, he created at three in the morning, a deep fake video of our chancellor using seven minutes of voice data and a still image. And the way we set it up, he shared his video, which we had ready to stream. And then we pivoted to Lee Lambert, who was our, our chancellor. Um, and we asked him the question, why should we not be afraid of AI? Um, we wanted to create a rich discussion between faculty and, and between um, students that positions the student as an expert. We need to you know, think about um, the banking model. We have to unbank these student or teacher-centered learning experience, let students be on the stage, let students have a voice. And um, the, the, the fabulous thing is they were teaching us. Both of these students were teaching us things we did not know, and they're continuing to do so. Yeah. It's moving so quickly, we can't be the only experts, and that's a good thing. I can't wait until I'm popular enough where someone's making deep fake dancing videos with me. And let's hope it stops there, right? Like, and it stays all above board, but. So, so the deep fake is an interesting complex thing because we have actors right now that are selling, um, what's it called, virtual clones. Um, we have um, lawsuits emerging. Those oh, are yeah. ethics issues that we can also engage our students at in this moment. Um, they're not simple. They're not cut and dry. Yeah. Um, and they, do engage our students. So even the questions related to how we use video, how we use audio and the misuse of these tools um, can really engage our students across the curriculum. Yeah, and speaking of this whole like deep fake idea, um, if you haven't watched the new season of Black Mary yet, I think it's the first episode. There's a very- Oh, that's season. terrible. <laughs> It, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you need to watch uh, it though. You do need to watch it. it. It's really good. Yeah, that's a resource. Add it to the resource list. Um, but okay, moving in a different direction, that's maybe a little less lighthearted and more hitting close to home and probably something that we're gonna have to be thoughtful and reflective about, which I lied. We're gonna do a poll before we do that. Um, let's talk about generative AI. So I'm gonna launch a poll right now. It should be open. Everyone should see it on their screen. I want to get an idea of the AI tools that we're using. So open up your poll. Everyone should be able to answer it. Um, you're going to answer all three questions, press submit. Um, I want to know which tools have you used? How often are you using these tools? And then how are you talking about it with your peers? Or how often? Not your students, with your peers. So your colleagues, your mentors, your maybe even you know your community around you. Um, there's an answer, it's it's all I talk about. And that is the answer for Reed and I, for sure. Maybe even you, Rufus. Um, it's all we talk about. And then once you're done answering the poll, if you want to share how you're using generative AI tools in the chat, because I actually think this is the one of the most important conversations to have is not just what are you using? How often are you using it? But how are we using it in our personal or professional use cases. I know when I'm feeling indecisive, which is rare, but it happens. Hey, chat GPT, where should, where should I go on vacation? I'm between these two spots. And I tell it exactly like how much money I want to spend, what I'm trying to do. And it actually did a really great job recommending Portugal. What's the weirdest thing you've done on chat GPT, Reed, recently? 
Um, I, I started following the chat feed for a second as you were speaking, because Brian Alexander said, Joan is awful is a great podcast or great episode of Black Mirror. It's devastating, but it's very good. So I just drifted. Weird use cases of the tool. I'll say in February, I did a workshop for the University of Arizona, just a volunteer workshop on how to use AI for writing with parents of fifth graders. And I introduced them to the tool. And then we talked about how you use writing at home. And I asked them questions about things they'd like to be able to do. And the cool things that they told me as, as parents of fifth graders in South Tucson, number one, they wanted to be able to explain to their seven-year-old what dementia means using language that they can understand. They wanted to be able to explain death to a seven-year-old. They wanted to be able to write a letter to their insurance people because one of their days in the emergency room was not covered and it should have been. I was in a um, Uber in California at the D12 Fusion Conference and he wanted to ask about how would he start his own car wash so, or car, you know, his car wash business. And so I created a business plan and created a table. But yeah. to me, I'm really interested in what other people might use it for. So I just, on a daily basis, doesn't matter where the topic is. I throw it into ChatGPT. I throw it into Bard. Now I'm using Claude. Now I'm using Llama. Um, all these tools I think we need to start playing with all the time. And, um, and, and to me, the most interesting ones were really when the parents came to me with, oh my goodness, I can use this to navigate the language of power. In other words, we have students as well who spend two thirds of their, t of, of their time on some papers or maybe one third of their time right rewriting into the language of power their ideas. Now they can use this as kind of a knowledge translator so that their language can move um, more quickly and they can spend more time on the cognitive work. Um, there's lots of interesting ways that this is being used. Yeah, there it, truly, truly so many ways. Um, well, I, I just closed the poll and I shared the results. Unshockingly, 89% of us have used ChatGPT. Um, threw a couple in there. Um, we definitely have a good amount of Again, when we talk about the spectrum, right, of comfortable with AI, uncomfortable with AI, scared, excited, which by the way, you can be both. <laughs> um, truly this audience is the entire spectrum. So as we go into our next topic, I want everyone to be mindful of the fact that the entire spectrum of comfortability with AI, comfortability with students using AI, comfortability with detection, um, the entire spectrum is in this conversation. So just a reminder to, to respect and hear out everyone's perspective, knowing that we all come from different places. So um, we probably read this by now, um, which was, uh, there's a study, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just read from the article itself on The Guardian. Um, tests on seven popular AI text detectors found that articles written by people who did not speak English as a first language were often wrongly flagged as AI generated. Scientists led by James Zhao, an assistant um, professor of biomedical data science at Stanford University, ran 91 English essays written by non-native English speakers through seven popular GPT detectors to see how well the programs performed. Now, what this study said is, hey, if they were non-English native speakers, they were, I think it was like twice as likely to get flagged. I can't exactly remember what it was. You can um, access this article just by searching on The Guardian, but there's a reason why. And so scientists trace the discrimination to the way that these detectors work, because these detectors are using the same model as GPT in reverse, right? And it's predictive text. So the more simple the text, the higher the likelihood that text is to be flagged for being AI generated. So it's this perplexity is, is the adjective they use or the term they use. Now, non-native English speakers tend to adopt simpler word choices, thus get flagged more often than native speakers. So here we're starting to see, and I think a lot of folks have seen the cracks start, you know, forming around this detection piece. Now I do see the need for stop gaps as we figure things out because stuff is moving so quickly. How are we possibly supposed to have an informed strategy seven months after this thing, you know, totally blew up our lives. So I read, I read, I just want to get your perspective on um, as there are a lot of perspectives out there. So I want your unique perspective and your personal perspective on how you'd recommend folks go about detection or just generally keeping an eye out for potential AI generated content from their students. So again, um, 
I'm a pack backer, but I'm not here to talk about pack back. I am looking at so many tools now that provide guidance for students um, and for faculty. My daughter's school, the librarian runs everything through GPT-0. It's a lot of time dropping those papers in. I don't think we're well equipped to be policing institutions. That's not our work. We're educators. And so for me, it is not about if, it's about when. We can't prevent the crisis, but we can mitigate it. We can um, handle it more effectively. I think as the fall approaches, we need to be thinking about, okay, well, how do we help the instructor who sees 98% as a flag of likelihood of plagiarism when we know that the tool has algorithmic bias or machine learning bias or whatever we want to call it, it reproduces the biases of the web and it also within its own structure has ways of privileging students who are more comfortable with the language of power. And so the, it also doesn't hold up in a court of law. It just doesn't. And so if we're not wanting to face, and I did a workshop on Thursday in Denver for Titan Parter, Partners, or excuse me, for Grail, and Titan, Titan Partners was in the room. This is an online learning group. And I asked them about their dystopic dreaming. What are your worst case scenarios you can imagine? Best case first, then worst case. And um, two of the things that come to mind for me when I think about what could go wrong in the, in the fall, one is that our dean's offices, our spaces that handle academic integrity are overfilled. The other one is that our testing centers are overfilled. Um, workshop a few months ago with Educause, a conclave with Melody Buckner, and the IDs in the room said that they're already having folks turning to blue books um, because of concerns about, um, and so what are we returning to or pivoting to in this moment is a point of concern. And as it relates to AI detection, I don't think the solution is moving towards better models for policing. We're not, that's not what we do. We need to move towards better models of learning, more authentic mm -hmm. assessment, more a variety of assessment methods, allowing students to do to create learning products rather than just, and I'm a writing teacher, rather than just papers to assess knowledge. Are there products that they can create that they can put into their portfolios that are workplace ready um, rather than um, leaning on what we're familiar with? I think we do need to shift now because AI actually can be used to either learn or to cheat learning. And a lot of our classes are not AI proof. And for those of you on the call, I would strongly recommend taking some time and just playing with, okay, if I were a student, how would I hack this class for better or for worse? What are the best case uses I could use for AI or the worst case I could use for AI? But I think going down the pathway of being too obsessed with academic integrity codes is missing the ballpark because our students are gonna be expected to use AI to do writing when they learn. And as Ethan Mollick and others have said, we expect Bard and ChatGPT to be under the hood of all of our office uh, applications very, very soon. It's already been well reported. It's mm -hmm. already gone through a lot of piloting. Um, so imagine when folks are able to quickly write within Google Docs or within Microsoft Word using a um, AI tool. That's yeah. going to, it's, things are going to change quite a bit. And, and for me, that's one of the reasons why I, we don't know how this landscape will, will move forward. My fantasy with the ed tech that we're at least bringing in transparently with our students, which is ed tech um, that has AI within it, is something that is student facing, that is Socratic, that poses questions to students rather than giving them the answers. That's my ideal. And that exists in some technologies. But all the same, having a back end to gather data is key. And Unless we're moving towards managed GPT, which is the non-vanilla version of ChatGPT, there's no easy way to gather data on student use unless you ask them to self-report. Yeah. And that means creating a culture of their experts, we're experts, we're sharing together how we're using AI as part of every assignment. We're discussing what we tried using AI for. And that's yeah. a weird idea, but helping them be transparent means now both within BARD and within ChatGPT, you can click on a button and share the thread of the whole inquiry process. So we know what the cognitive work of the student is versus the work that's generated by ChatGPT. Uh, yeah. That's a long-winded answer, Kelsey. I'm, and I'm it, well, no, I, I love that you're bringing this up is like, 
the technologies I think have realized, and I'm actually going to launch a poll about detection um, so folks can answer it as we have this discussion, but um, I think these technologies realized like they wanted to create something transformative and awesome. You know, we're we're all riding horses and they're inventing the car. Um, I don't think that they made this being like, oh, we want to destroy the everything in education and completely shift the paradigm, you know? And I think they're realizing, okay, how do we now support educators who are so terrified of this? And I think exactly to your point, now students can share a link, you know, with you. It's just a URL that takes you or whoever it is to their chat history. And that could be the way in which they're disclosing their use of AI of, hey, you know, I'm submitting my paper to Professor Reed and saying, hey, I want to let you know I used AI to help give me feedback on my thesis statement. Here's a link to the chat. You can read through it and see that I didn't copy and paste. And that's, um, that's just one, one angle to consider, which is with exactly. the existing assignments, how do we start with what we've got with the, the short-term strategies? If we don't have the time to rewrite our whole curricular piece, what can we add on in terms of helping students self-report metacognitively what they learned, what tech they used, including AI. I have a piece about this that I uh, published in Community College Daily uh, last month. I'm gonna highlight that do one, this. don't worry. <laughs> very low tech, very simple solution that we can approach. Or um, we can do something more extensive, like in the faculty development courses that we have, one of our um, participants who's a department head is rewriting her coding classes so that students have to teach each other the coding. They're able to use AI within the coding process, but instead of asking them to generate code as their outcome, they're asked to teach mm -hmm. each other. You can't learn it. You have to really know the stuff if you're teaching each other. And so these are like ways of rethinking how do we help students demonstrate their knowledge in new ways that are relevant to them yeah. that will last beyond the, the gated walls of the, of the higher education institution. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, there's a poll up right now, uh, just AI detection pulse, two simple questions. What have you used? How often are you using detectors? Um, I think I think the question of how, how will we potentially handle cheating, that's something that I've actually chatted about a little bit in the last few months, which is my recommendation as just somebody who used to teach 180 students in high school would be first day of class, I'm going to get a sample of their voice. And that's going to be my AI detector. Uh, and some of us don't have the luxury of being able to have pen and paper in a classroom, right? Some of us teach online asynchronously. But if that is an option for you, it's one I would highly recommend is just getting that, that capture of voice. And then just like looking out for clues. Like, I honestly think this is going to be a game of, of you know, if, if I received a, a paper from my student who hasn't showed up to class once and it sounds like they have a PhD in my content matter. I'm going to probably do some digging, do some research. Maybe I will talk to that detector and see what it has to say. Um, but I think there's a lot of work we could do as educators just to suss it out before we use a detector or a detector is just really a tenth of our entire, I don't know, reaction to. 100%. Kelsey, one thing that is already happening, happens a lot in K-12 already, is just iterative submissions of drafts. So engineering design process, you're expected to share each prototype, what you, you know, optimize for each variable um, or each engineering design phase. Same thing with the writing process. We ask them to share drafts as they progress. Um, we're able to sense you know, what they're doing at each stage rather than looking at end products, which you know, we don't want students to be tempted to skip learning and use the AI to sort of bypass the core cognitive work that they need to do in the class. So if we do it in smaller chunks, if we chunk it into smaller pieces throughout, then it's more likely that we can have a conversation with students as they progress. So that assessment is not a summative from us, but it's a dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. Um, now, our next story, I'm going to just briefly inform, and we're actually going to skip over it, not because it's not important, just because there's another story I want to get to, but want to just make everyone aware that AI is starting to affect policy outside of education in hiring practices. So this is a really interesting article. If you haven't read it yet, um, Caitlin uh, Kern from PacBec can put it in the chat, but a good example, and I would definitely have everyone just stay in tune with what's happening around us with AI, because this I can see coming back into educational policy with admin, admissions and things like that. 
Um, so I'm going to close out news with a plug for this episode of The Daily that I think eight of my team members sent me the morning it was released. It's called Suspicion, Cheating, and Bans AI Hits American Schools. And the host did an interview with a couple of students. Some were anonymous. Some disclosed their uh, identity. The anonymous students were admitting to doing a lot of cheating. Um, and there was also one professor featured, which I thought was a great professor voice because it was basically him just saying, like, I want connection with my students and not robots, you know? It is, um, everyone in this room should listen to this podcast because it's they so let good. the faculty and the students speak, and it's so well done. It's so well done. And and this student who I have in this picture, his name is uh, her name is Aliana. I heard her voice and I almost cried. I just felt like it was me, but back in college. Um, and so much of what she said was just so powerful. Um, and I, because I'm me, I reached out to Aliana and I was like, will you please be my friend? Um, like, I want to know you, I want to have a relationship with you. And, and I was lucky in that she said, yeah, for sure. And, and I really want to work on a couple of different pieces with her. Uh, <laughs> and Reed's like, of course you did, you know? Uh, so I asked Aliana to write me a manifesto. Um, and that manifesto I'm trying to get published right now, uh, for, for her, because I think it's powerful, but I do want to read one thing that she wrote in this manifesto. Um, I am a bit of a technophobe and keep in mind, Aliana is at, uh, UCLA. She's a writing major, um, or an English major. I might get that wrong. Um, computer science majors seem like superheroes to me. Same. I stay off social media and I don't buy new gadgets until my old ones are shattered and malfunctioning. But as I watch the explosion of AI across nearly every conceivable field, I recognize that this is a tool I need to embrace. And it would be brilliant if, instead of having to figure this out all on my own, AI could be integrated in my education. And that's her plea. And, and if you listen to the daily episode, she says, I used chat GPT and I immediately felt icky because I pay to go to college to critically think and learn critical thinking skills. I'm not here to have a robot do my homework. And she does go on to say that she used it because she was struggling to understand a chapter of Beowulf. And she said, explain it to me like I'm five. And then she understood it. So you have this example of her figuring out how to use it ethically and in a way that's pedagogically sound, but also starving to be taught how to use it in more powerful ways. So Reed, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, but we were talking about this idea of um, play-based learning. So do you wanna just kind of share where your head goes when you when you see this written by a student you just be mentioned that, at UCLA? You explained it to me, uh, or you mentioned that she said, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. And we had a student that shared with us um, a similar strategy. He says, when it's three in the morning, and he wants to learn, it's not easy to find someone to talk with, to have a sparring partner, to have a conversation with. And so we'll ask um, ChatGPT to explain quantum mechanics to him like he's an eight, eight year old, then like he's a 12 year old, then he's like a 16 year old. He'll keep upping the age level in kind of a constructivist sense of building upon more simple knowledge, having a more complex idea, um, he described and he identifies and, and is an autistic person. He says, I go down these autistic rabbit holes at three in the morning where it's able to be my companion and my friend as we learn more deeply about things that would be otherwise really difficult to understand. And so for me, this is a huge opportunity to say, okay, well, what do our students know about AI? And it might be like my daughter said to me this morning, she loves DJ access it on Spotify, um, which is an AI um, that, that basically tells her, what did she tell me this morning? Um, she said that it was surprising to her because um, it always knew the song she wanted to play. She never skips a song because it's that good. And then we started talking, and my daughter's in, in going into 10th grade, but she, she um, was talking about the deep fakes, Ariana Grande, um, and Drake have a bunch of deep fake audio on, on TikTok that are rolling through, um, even singing in Arabic. Um, the Beatles are covering Space Odyssey. I was doing this as, actually last night. I was watching, I love cover songs um, of anything. I love listening to 
Prince do a cover of Joni Mitchell, et cetera. Those are real covers. But then I go online and I find the Beatles doing a cover of David Bowie's Space Odyssey or a bunch of Johnny Cash and Elvis songs that they never sung. They're singing other people's songs. So this stuff is moving quickly. She's teaching me. I'm listening. She shares about how her friends are playing with the tool. And I realize, okay, I need to start playing with this tool too. And so one of the things that I'm promoting with our faculty, is just start playing with this, start playing with this. It's changing rapidly. It's hard to judge because it's changing so quickly, but we need to be playing with it. Number one, regardless of our policies and our position. The other thing that I can't say that uh, enough is that we need to think about preventing crises because I do anticipate crises in the fall and there are small steps we can take. And one of those is thinking about do our institutions have expectations for faculty or recommendations to have a section within the syllabus that is a syllabus statement that clearly communicates whatever you ask of your students? Mm -hmm. And if you also have a lot of busy adjuncts, maybe it's creating five or six different syllabus statements that might reflect different points of view and values, but making sure there's a clear communication during the first week so that we're not creating a gotcha experience in the classroom where we move from educator to policeman. That's not our job. Absolutely. We need to communicate that at the start. And we can do that now before the semester starts, even if we can't repackage our curriculum entirely or rethink it in terms of how AI might be used by students. That might feel like pie in the sky, but in the short run, we can think about communication practices for our students and that's critical. And if anybody has any cool ideas about what you've tried that we should try at Pima Community College, let me know. This is an obsession of mine right now. I was going to say that this wasn't pre-planned, but that was like a perfect segue into the next poll, which is all about AI policy. Um, so what you're planning for this fall, the poll was just open. But with that, I want to just, just, I think, echo a lot of the sentiment you shared, which is we are in a position where our students are probably more familiar with generative AI. They're better at using it. Um, and they can teach us and we can have a learning experience together. And what a gift. You know what I mean? Like if, if we view that as, oh, shoot, I don't know if as much as my student. Now I feel less confident. Now I just need to avoid it. Why, ha why, why go down that rabbit hole? What a powerful opportunity for you to learn from your students, build a stronger connection with them that leverages AI for a bunch of different reasons, but you're still connected to the student. And I, I will say, you know, I put on my student hat, you know, and it was a couple decades ago, but when I was able to have like a learning moment with an instructor where they were learning something alongside me, it just made me trust them more. It made me want to be in their classroom more. It made me want to continue. I wouldn't have been a chem chemistry major if it wasn't for my AP chemistry teacher, who was also my chemistry teacher before I was in the AP class, right? It just, I committed to that educator and to that discipline because he was so curious about me and my learning style and, and what I can contribute as much as I was about chemistry. So that's that's my plug for this play-based learning for learning alongside students. But there's a there was a good question that came in the chat that I want, I want to address, um, which is this concept of there are some disciplines that students just need to learn the facts. I could think about this with medicine, right? Um, I I don't want my nurse having to pull out and and Google the the milliliters to lead, you know, conversions or microliters. They they should be able to know these things. They should know definitions and um, accountants. Uh, there are just certain professions where they need to know things. So so read. How do we convince our students? that memorizing facts are still important. And yeah, what would your advice be to educators who, who need to, at the end of the day, have their students memorize facts? I'm absolutely, yeah, that's a very difficult and a real question. Um, we have graduates of our institution that have to take certification exams. So whether I believe in standardized tests or not, we have to prep them and get them ready to be able to move into the next space where they're gonna have other standardized test experiences. And one of the things that's important to realize is that tools like ChatGPT or even these new emerging tools that you'll see because they're already being piloted all, all over the place. We have tools that can ingest content and create flashcards, study questions, um, 
uh, multiple choice experiences, drag and drop experiences, just by dropping in a video or by dropping in text and converting it into a learning interactive, students can start practicing those pieces that are lower order in the Bloom's taxonomy, but they're still important. We do need to memorize some things to be able to use them. And there's a lot of low stakes tools we can create to help them practice, or we can encourage them to use chat GPT and tools like that to start practicing now. I think and on the flip side, this is something that came to me, Kelsey, as a side piece. Like I noticed in the chat thread, people are saying, well, we had a syllabus statement or an AI policy given to us. And I was remembering the Titan um, partner study, which says that over half students don't care. They're still gonna use AI. Um, if we can have first week discussions where we talk to them about what they're learning, talk to them about why it matters, talk to them about AI, talk to them maybe through a Google form each week that gives a formative feedback loop of what was your experience. You know, you mentioned the daily, Kelsey. The faculty member in that show said, you know what, I kind of dread seeing a beautiful discussion post because I don't know if AI created it now. It's a new question that's nagging at me. And so they were kind of turned off. I think students may have the same experience where they go through your discussions and they're like, I'm not into it because I can tell everyone's hacking it with an AI. Unless you pose better questions or a different kind of an interactive that's more dynamic, um, you're not going to know. But how do you change that before the fall? I don't know. But all I would say would be if you have a weekly feedback loop that lets them share, okay, well, what's happening within their learning experience, you might find out what's happening. Are they dreading a threaded discussion because it might be something where they fear they're not talking to real people, they're talking to a bot? Um, these are things we need to start talking with our students about because they know it. They know mm -hmm. it from TikTok. They know it from all over the place. We can't hide these tools from our students. Um, and so I just was pivoting back to that question. Yeah. The policy piece is huge. Academic integrity, which is being thought about it from campus to campus. I had a conversation last week with a superintendent from a Boston school who I love the way he thinks, but he said at this point, they're just going to lean on their, on their core policy right now, which he believes address it. I think we need to, if you haven't already at your institution, revisit your policy as it relates to what does plagiarism mean? Uh, what would be a humane approach to acknowledging that students are gonna use AI or maybe misuse AI with the expectation that they need to be able to use in the workplace in the future. So they're gonna be using it in ways that faculty may be uncomfortable with. Um, faculty need academic freedom to make choices around what AI is allowable in their classrooms. It's complicated, but these cannot be made by one silo of an institution. Mm -hmm. I don't think they need to be a, a group of stakeholders that are diverse, that represent IT, but also academic, but also the provost's office, et cetera. And that's a larger project and an evolving project where policy is needed, but it's not going to solve the problem of students using these tools. Yeah. They're going to use them anyway. And we have to have transparent discussions with our students, I think, to help them feel comfortable sharing what they're learning each week. Metacognition there's an opening to return to best practices yeah. with metacognitive reflective learning. To and, me, that's exciting. And I'll even go back. I, I didn't mention this um, quote, but this was uh, Aliana's words. I'm not asking for a full-fledged academic AI revolution in which we're expected to use AI in all our work. I just want to be prepared to navigate an AI-fueled future. Teach me how to streamline my research processes through AI. Explain to me what questions to ask AI chatbots to get the most helpful responses. Show me how I can use these resources to improve my administrative efficiency and my data an analysis. Help me receive edits and constructive criticism from AI. Prepare me for the real world where AI is beginning to touch all areas of work. So I think this is great when we're thinking about our policy is that our students just want some guidance as like we do, right? Everyone they, just wants- They know to that it's going to- they know that it's going to touch the workplace. And it's that there's little data points floating around that say 14% of the US market has tried it. Uh, Ethan Mollick in his pod podcast with Microsoft says two thirds of, of users find it useful in America yep. um, without any training. They're just, it's they're playing with it and they're learning it and they already find it useful. And other people are saying, well, this is a 30% to 50% productivity boost. Um, they know that they can use it in their workplace. They're going to be using it. Um, do we want to prepare them for what's around the corner? I think so. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I want to want to end our session today. Where I'm going to actually skip ahead and give some recommended resources before I uh, ask final questions. 
So our favorite resources, there's a podcast. It's every day. It's called your everyday AI.com. If you just want to just keep up to date with AI and hear from experts, it's a daily podcast. There's an episode every day. You can watch it live. You can listen to it. You can watch a recording on YouTube. You can listen to it. Um, there's also a newsletter I subscribe to called The Neuron that I'd recommend. It's like usually a five minute read and it's just news around AI. Um, here's the episode of that daily podcast. Give a shout out to Aliana. I'm again, her biggest fan. Um, you could read the DOE's official, our office of educational technologies, recommendations, AI insights. Um, it's 70 pages, but it's actually pretty quick to read fonts, big, a lot of images. Um, there's a great podcast from Reed. That's not, it's not Reed's podcast, a recommendation from Reed. <laughs> um, it's not AI specific, but hard work from the New York times. And then Pima has this landing page, information page about AI um, for AI teaching and learning, and it's linked here. And then also I am going to plug for Reed a piece he wrote um, on transparent AI practices. And I actually wrote that with the assistance of chat GPT. So it may be a weird creature to take a look at. I it's wanna, a fun article to read. I want to pull back as we close this piece on the policy to, to keep in mind, like one out of five, based on the WCET study, one out of five um, institutions are implementing policy already, um, but most people aren't moving forward yet at the higher ed level in terms of data security, instructional use, intellectual property, or property, privacy, syllabus statements, um, accessibility, mm -hmm. all the things that might be points of concern for you in terms of tech acquisition. How do you, how do you assess the AI underneath the hood of the tools that you're using? Those are things that you're gonna have to consider but I would think, okay, just like you do with your students, what is within their reach? What is the next step within your institution? Um, and I think it's learning how to communicate with our students about AI, then building stakeholders, building up policies, then thinking about how do we build AI into the curricular experiences of our students, um, mm -hmm. starting to share, like we have a teaching and learning center that has a monthly event where we just talk. It is everybody at the college, talking about what their hopes are, what their fears are, being real about, and that includes people who come to the room and say, I will not allow my students to use AI. And they need a space to say that. Yeah. Absolutely. Having these conversations right now, it's so important. And, and I don't think we can move forward with stuff unless we have a space where faculty can talk to each other. Really don't. And I, and I do think like, if there's one thing that anybody could, from, for me personally, if there's one thing anyone could take away from this conversation, who's on like trying to figure out how they're going to go about life, <laughs> liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Um, it's talk to your students. It's like literally just have, even if it's just one, cause you're not ready to have a full class conversation, just grab one student, just have a conversation. I feel like it immediately addresses your fears and immediately reestablishes your faith in humanity. And like, reminds us why we taught. Like we taught not to police our students, but to like learn from them, teach them, engage with them, build relationships. Um, so let's end with a question for uh, Dr. Rufus Glasper. Um, and this read, this is your question. So I'm plagiarizing, but I'm citing my source right now, um, which is you're talking to presidents, provosts, administrators often. Um, what are you hearing right now? I am hearing uh, confusion. I am hearing fear. I am hearing uh, um, I need to do something, but I don't know what. So as I'm hearing the conversations today, uh, I, I, I really am, am, am want to ask a, a quick question and read you, you might have a response to this. You know, as faculty and, and, and staff and administrators and others, uh, we get caught up with administrative and management tasks. Uh, and what we need is time. You're asking uh, faculty to get more engaged and to understand uh, different iterations of generative AI. And, and can, can we positively use, and I think the answer is yes, can we positively use generative AI to identify the task that can be done by AI that will give more time to faculty and staff so they can devote it to uh, uh, the focus on this particular issue as to how they can better understand generative AI and be able to use it in a task in the classroom and not have to fill out the administrative tasks that they have to do on a, on a regular basis. It's a, uh, really good, it's a really good question and a really good point. AI will generate, and all these AIs will generate possible things, Rufus, 
that your institutions can do to save time, to get to that 30% time savings that they're talking about it within the, the private sector. Um, but it's also something that we should be wary about because there may be a misuse of, you know, for example, Vanderbilt was in the news when they used ChatGPT to write an article about a school shooting in response. It was a big news piece a while back. There can be misuses of the tool as it relates to FERPA. And the AI may suggest things that are related to student data that we probably wouldn't do. So we can't just lean on AI for ideas, but we can work with AI idea to generate a bunch of ideas for why how we might save time ingesting a closed data set and then quickly generating reports based upon that closed data, working perhaps with a managed GPT platform that allows us to share data that's institutional but might be not public data. And you know, there's other ways to process these things, um, but there's a lot of daily practices with every one of our staff members where we can show them how they can save a little bit of time in their workplace using these tools. Not to use it surreptitiously, but to use it transparently within, within the space. I think you're right, Rufus. We can and we should ask AI, but we should just take it with a grain of salt and lean on what we already know. Uh, in our earlier conversation before the webinar started, uh, I talked about practices, policies, uh, and procedures and such. Uh, as we're having this conversation, and I know it's instruction-based, it's faculty-based, and you're talking about to vice presidents and provosts and deans, uh, what, what, what needs to happen in terms of educating the CEOs uh, and the board so that when you need to move to the policy stage, that they're ready and, 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 and you're not being the delay. Uh, is, is there any idea or thoughts about a similar kind of webinar to engage uh, those individuals and, and maybe on a, on, 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 on a, on a higher level, not as granular, uh, because you don't want them getting into debates about what's happening in the classroom. Right. So I would say there are events like the event that I was at in Denver with Grail last week that was primarily people in senior leadership positions, vice presidents, et cetera where they were able to talk to each other, frankly, about their concerns and what they need to happen. Um, and at that event, data was shared that shows that administrators are often the least familiar with AI tools, ChatGPT, BARD, et cetera, as well as faculty. Students know the tools better than we do. So the transition point, even with chancellors and presidents and vice presidents, to me is we need to create spaces, Rufus, where they can come together within community college sector, within all of higher ed, um, maybe even bridging K-12 in higher ed, which is one of my fantasies that we need to do more of, to talk about you know, what are humane practices, how do we support and move away from one strike practices, if that's your belief, restorative justice practices that are not trying to penalize students for the misuse of a poorly communicated expectation on a tool. Um, so. To me, we need these gatherings immediately. We need lots of gatherings between kindred spirits that are our VPs at similar institutions to think about what is our policy going to be as it relates to um, handling possible crises in the dean's office filling up with plagiarism complaints and the testing center overfilling, which is what our testing center director mentioned at one of our roundtable, or so we have monthly roundtables through our teaching and learning center. And that was one of her concerns. Is my space going to start filling up? Um, they need space to talk to each other at that level, Rufus. Absolutely. And then when they when they do share board their vision, it gives the rest of the community an opportunity to say, okay, let's take this seriously. Let's work as a team. Let's build a um, cross department, cross division team that can move it forward in a sustainable way that includes students on the team. It's really important that students have voice in this as well because they know better than us on a lot of the stuff. I, I'm glad you, you closed with having students on the team. And what words of wisdom can you give the group or advice relative to uh, how do you bring students to the table to be a part of this voice and possibly teach us and others what they are learning so that we can better support them? Uh, so it's it's coming up with a role for the student in this discussion around generative AI so that they feel uh, that they're being listened to and not being judged. 
so important. I, you know, one of the challenges of most learning management systems right now is that there's no equivalent of the five minutes before class or the hallway that we meet outside in front of and have small talk. It's hard to make small talk with our students when we've got so much content to cover. But if we can create spaces within our learning management systems for virtual meetings or virtual spaces where they can share what's on their mind, um, to have peer discussions is critical. Safe spaces where they can talk about um, everything. It might not just be AI connected pieces, but things that are much broader. Um, but giving them a space where they can talk to you that is not just a scheduled office hour, having very clear guidance in your meet your instructor widget within inside your course whether you're teaching online or teaching in person having a way where students know how to reach you and how to reach their peers so that they can dive deeper into um reflecting what they love what's helping them learn in the class and the ai is part of that it, it could be as simple as a google document uh open space where they come in and they share resources with each other and they're given bonus points for sharing resources connected with like it's one of the things we do in our uh, four week uh, AI for teaching and learning course, they co construct knowledge in the class, because everything is changing every week. Why not have the participants in your class co construct the knowledge, and your role as a guide on the side your role as a facilitator your role as a curator, but they're the producers. And I often think that if we're doing most of the cognitive work as instructors and the students are doing less, we're not achieving the goal of helping them step beyond the college walls. We need to empower them to be the knowledge producers. And that might start with simple strategies like creating shared resources connected with your course on how can you use AI to learn your course more effectively? Here's three ways I tried. And there's a bunch of resources out there right now, you know, tools to help you study, tools to help with sparring partners if you have to practice debates, tools to help with coding. They can generate this information. Um, some folks are saying like uh, Jenny in the chat feed, Claude is not available in Canada. There are regional limitations for different tools, depending on where you're calling in from. Um, let them generate what's working, what's not. It'll change every week. And they're, what, who better to keep the pulse of it than them? Yeah. Kelsey, it's, it's back to you. I'm going to have to run. Yeah, it yeah. I also like, right as, as, right as I have my wife, I went out. Well, um, thank you so much all for joining. Uh, Rufus and Reed, thank you so much for sharing your words, your wisdom, your encouragement. Um, and uh, this webinar recording and the deck will be sent to you after this session. So you will have that coming your way. I also just wanna share, if you're curious about what Packback is doing, and I'm sure Reed, I, I told Reed not to talk about his use of Packback or his relationship with us, but um, would probably share, you know, Packback is a pedagogy first technology platform that does leverage AI to teach students to fish instead of give them the, give them the fish. So if you are, Curious to hear about what we're doing at Packback. You want to hear from a team member. You want to do something with AI. You don't want to be left in the dust, but you're not quite sure where to start. Email our team at curious at packback.co. Otherwise, uh, I can't thank you enough, Reed, for being a wonderful uh, person. And I and I put this in the Q&A, but I just find, find Reed on LinkedIn and follow him um, because he's constantly posting cool things, wonderful resources. You, you could do that to me as well. I try to post cool things and cool resources, but I won't plug myself, but I will plug Reed. Uh, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate the candor. I appreciate the respect we all had for one another and our difference in opinions and thanks for asking questions and engaging. But Reed, always a pleasure. Let's do it again. I look forward to it, Kelsey. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and the great questions. Keep the discussions going. Everything is moving so quickly. Yeah. And, um, if you have ideas or resources to share with us, at Pima Community College, we will use them today. As soon as you send them, we'll add them into our live Google documents where we're co-constructing knowledge with our faculty to share with the larger community as there's so much happening right now and we need to help each other. We really do. Yeah, yeah. Well, wonderful seeing you. Enjoy uh, the remainder of your Thursday. <laughs> Thanks, Kelsey. Good seeing Bye, you everyone. all. Take care.